Welcome. This is the last lecture of the course. You have a lot of information now. I put that on uh, its learning. And um, well, this is the information on the last lecture today and the lesson on Monday, 12 to 14. And the exam preparation three opportunities to get answers to your questions, either by writing an email to Jorgen, the scientific assistant on the course, or the individual question time on June 1, 10 to 14, about the Shell Cantina, and the, more, the, the, the public question hour on June 4, 14 to 16, in uh, the Fluids Engineering Laboratory. And then I, or we, Reda and me, ask you to do the course evaluation that you find in the left menu. I saw already some of you have started. That's very good. So I hope all of you will do that to give us uh, feedback. So done. <coughs> but the topic today is the trial exam. Because this is the first time the course is given, so um, Reda and I decided to give you a trial exam. And that was actually formulated, to tell you also that, by Jürgen. And you will also get uh, the solution. But before I asked, I said that yesterday, I repeat it, you do the solution, please do it yourself. Without, with today you get some information, but for the other exercises, please do it without. Because that is the situation that is really relevant for the exam. So, then we look at that. And the, first of all, I would like to say the exam is um, longer than the exam uh, the, that you will have on June 6 will be, most certainly, because this is a lot of work to do, but it is manageable. And you see the topics. The first is on ODEs. That is not the key um, feature of the course, but it is essential. Part two is on the linear, <coughs> sorry, the linear equation equation, <coughs> doing an analysis for the formal time-centered space scheme. That was also done in the exercises. That brings me to the remark, all theoretical and also practical programming uh, regards of the exercises are relevant for the exam, except for exercise 12. That is no outside pencil. So this problem is very relevant because that is essential to have a scheme that is convergent and to show that and to do the theoretical check of it. And you saw it in the practical application that is really relevant for doing computations. Number three is on conservation laws. We had two exercises on that. So that is also relevant. And four is on the Laplace equation, that in that case it's the 2D statistical <coughs> equation, and that is also quite relevant. That's an, an example of an elliptic equation. We'll not have time to go through everything, but my suggestion is that we start with um, exercise 2, problem 2, and then let's see. Maybe we take four before three. So then we see how far we come. And it's no problem if we don't get everything here. You will get the solution and you will see that it is. The solution is, by the way, very comprehensive. So it is not all what is in the solution supplied by Jürgen would be expected from you in the exam to answer. When you do the exam, uh, we ask you to uh, give motivation of your assumptions and your derivations so that you write, you just don't, do not give an answer, you show how you got the answer. And also when there are computations involved, you show the computations. That is important to get full points. And don't be discouraged by anything. The exam will be manageable and even if you can't answer all, answer what you can. That will give points if it's right. Okay, so then 
Let's start with exercise two. So the linear vector equation is for a time-centered space, and it is given here. And the first task is determine if the forward time center space scheme is consistent for the linear vector equation. Find the order of accuracy of the discretization. So that is a clear uh, task. Show consistency of the FTCS scheme. So that's the final exam. to see here the discretization in that case of the time derivative. That is in, in the right form. So we can take it as it is and insert the exact solution instead of the numerical approximation. And then we see what uh, the error will be of that. So that means the truncation error is then defined by the exact solution. In that case it is u of point x j and the time level t n plus 1. That is what u j n plus 1 is approximating. Minus the exact solution at x j t n divided by the time step delta t. Plus the advection velocity c times now it is u j plus 1 n so that means we have to take them that at the grid point xj plus 1 at tn minus the exact solution at xj minus 1 tn divided by 2 delta x. And in here we assume that u of xt is the exact solution to the linear affection equation, that is, it fulfills ut plus c u x equal to zero. We'll use that later on. Now, what is the ta what shall we do here? Well, it is quite natural to do the Taylor expansion around the grid point xj in the time level tn. So that means we do then here a Taylor expansion around that and then we get yeah, some use Taylor expansions and we do that then around simply the, the Tn plus 1 as Tn plus delta T, so that we can see here nicely the, the delta T. And then we do the Taylor expansion, and now I skip writing at xj Tn, so it is just u plus delta T, time derivative by the index notation here, plus delta T squared half, second time derivative, plus higher order terms. So that is uh, usually enough. In case uh, it would not be enough, we would see it in the end and we would have to add some other terms. Similarly, for the space, for getting these here, u, x, j, plus and minus 1 at tn, we can write that as u of x, j, plus or minus delta x at Tn, and then we do now the Taylor expansion in x, so we get u plus delta x space derivative plus delta x squared, squared half u x x, and here we need one more, delta x to the power 3. 
3 divided by 6 third space derivative plus higher order terms. Then we insert uh, these Taylor expansions into the truncation error. So that we need a little bit space for that. So let's start. So we insert simply for this, we insert what we have derived here. So that is then the u plus delta t u t plus delta t squared half u t t plus I order terms. Minus u over delta t, minus u over delta t, and then the c term plus c. There we have first to take the plus. Let's see, I just did it only for the plus, so we just correct that so that we have also the minus xj minus 1, xj minus delta x, then we get a minus here, minus 1 squared is plus, this is okay, we get a minus here. So first we use then the plus, and we have then the u plus uh, delta x ux plus delta x squared half ux x plus delta x to the power 3 divided by 6, third space derivative and higher order terms minus and now we get this for the minus then we have u minus delta <coughs> x u x plus delta x squared half u x x minus delta x to the power 3 divided by 6 u x x x plus higher order terms divided by 2 delta x. And then we know the lot is dropping out and we see immediately this u here, u cancel and we can factorize the delta t and also this goes away so we get simply u t plus delta t half u t t and for the spatial discretization, the terms with the plus u and this term, u and this term, they cancel, the minus there, and the delta x we can factorize, that is already gone, take it anyway, and here the delta x is gone, and that is 2. So then we get that simplified to ux minus minus plus ux2 ux divided by 2 is ux. And then we get this term here twice because we have here a minus minus and this 2 cancelled with this 2 so we get delta x squared over 6 times third space derivative. <coughs> so we can write that. Delta x squared by 6, third 
space derivatives plus high order terms. Actually, the high order terms would be delta x to the power 4. A little interesting, this is the interesting thing, and we see this is order delta t in time with delta x squared in space. So that means the scheme is first order in time, second order in space. So the conclusion is forward time center space scheme is first order accurate in time. And second order accurate in space. So that is what we get. Second order accurate in space. So that is the result of the consistency analysis. The important thing is now to note that the truncation error goes to zero as we let delta t and delta x go to zero. And that means that it is consistent. So let's see. Okay, that. So the truncation error goes to zero for delta t, delta x to zero. And that means that the scheme is FTCS is consistent. for the accuracy, so therefore we took that first. Okay, thereby we have now established consistency. To show convergence, sorry that wasn't it, it's now the, the second question, we have to watch that first. Determine if the method is convergent. So that is the second question. To do that, we remember the Lex equivalence theorem. We have established consistency. Then the Lex equivalence theorem says if the scheme the scheme is stable, if and only if it is convergent or vice versa. So that means the convergence that we are supposed to show is equivalent then to stability. So therefore we have to establish stability. If we can show that it is stable, then it is convergent. Can we show it is unstable? Then it is not convergent. Builds upon decomposing the solution in a finite number of Fourier nodes. We can that we can do that by Fourier transform, and then it's just enough to investigate one Fourier mode. If that is amplified, then it is unstable. The scheme is unstable. If uh, any mode is damped, the scheme is stable. So then we insert. Fourier mode, which we can express as its amplitude, that's the amplitude of the Fourier mode with the weight number k, and that is dependent on time, so that gets the time index and the spatial um, 
description is because we assume periodicity by trigonometric function, that we use the uh, complex representation e to the i k x j. We insert that for the discrete value u j n into the finite difference method. And the finite difference method we can get when we multiply what we saw before by delta t and uh, move the known ujn to the right hand side, then we can express the forward time centered space scheme in this form. So before it was ujn minus uj divided by delta t, now we have brought it to the right hand side after multiplying by delta t. That gives them c times delta t over delta x, which is the current number, the 2 in the denominator. And then we have here the difference uj plus 1n minus uj minus 1n, where the capital C is the C from the attraction velocity in the linear attraction equation times delta t over delta, delta x is the current number. So then we simply do that. And then we have for uj n plus 1, we have then to insert this with n plus 1. So u hat n plus 1 for weight number k e to the i k x j is equal to, and here we just take the Fourier mode as it is, n e to the i k x j and minus current number half and now we take this at uh, for j plus 1 we have to take here the j plus 1 so u hat uh, n k e to the i k x j plus 1 correspondingly for um, j minus 1 e to the i k x j minus 1. And then we can divide by e to the i k, so we divide by e to the i k x j. And here we use the, the x j plus 1 minus 1, x j plus minus 1 is equal to the x j plus minus delta x. We used that already in the Taylor expansion. And then we can write this exponential as e to the i k x j times e to the i k plus or minus delta x. And then we can nicely get rid of this term. And the result is the uk at n here, here. So then we do this factorization. First we get the 1 minus curve number half. And then of this we will have e to the i k delta x minus e to the minus i k delta x. And then we can use um, Euler's, well, we have already available by that, we have the amplification factor. So from that we get the amplification factor. And that is defined then by the ratio 
of the amplitudes at the new and at the old time level. So that means what is in square brackets, that is the amplification factor. So then we get that G of K delta X, we have number times grid spacing, is equal to 1 minus current number half e to the i k delta x minus e to the minus i k delta x. And then we can simplify that by using Euler's formula. Euler's formula tells us that e to the plus or minus i k delta x is equal to the cosine, and then it doesn't matter plus or minus, cosine the same, but here for the mind, for the sine it matters i sine of k delta x. And if we do that we see that the cosine here cancels and that we get so we have minus minus two times i sine kx. So from that, we see that the amplification factor, g of k delta x, is then equal to 1 minus imaginary unit c, current number, and the sine of k delta x. Because we said we get two times this expression that cancels with this two. So we get then this. Okay, so that is then the amplification factor that we get and the condition for stability is that this, because we are multiplying that in each time step, we are multiplying the amplitude from the old time level to, uh, with this, we see it here. And for these amplitudes to be bounded, we need that the absolute value of the amplification factor is smaller or equal to 1. In our case, the amplification factor is complex because it has a real part that is 1 and a complex part which is minus current number sine of k delta x. check in our case the modulus of g of beta and it is then easier to do it squared than because that is equivalent to show this or to show the square of the modulus small equal to one but the advantage of this is when we have a complex number that we simply can take the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared we don't need to, to, to do it. take the square square root of the thing so that is then equal to we have already identified the real part is 1, the <coughs> part minus c sine k delta x, so this is then minus sine beta. So then we get here the 1 plus, and that is then uh, the we get minus minus this plus c squared sine squared of beta. So and um, that has to be small or equal to 1 for all wave numbers pi, but that is not the case. In fact, it is larger than 1 if uh, c is not 0 uh, for all beta uh, that are smaller or equal pi 
except for beta equal to zero. Then it's okay. But that, that doesn't help. It is enough if we find one beta where this condition is not satisfied. We we'll test the whole for But here it is satisfied. It is not fulfilled for almost all beta. And C0 is not an option because that would mean then that either the C vector velocity or the time that is zero, which doesn't make sense. So that means that um, so this condition that we have here is for C equal to uh, not zero. If we would take that as a condition, we would get C equal to zero. But as I just said, this doesn't make sense. So that means that the scheme is unstable. We cannot fulfill this condition. There's no chance. And we have seen that in the numerical experiments when you when we tried that in the in the um, Examples, it um, explodes and you very quickly get uh, enormous numbers, so it is simply useless. So, if we know it is unstable, then we can conclude from Lex equivalence theorem that it is not convergent. That is, that is the key. Point. Because that was the question: Is the scheme convergent? And we have shown by the Neumann stability analysis at the scheme is unstable. It's not possible for um, the linear Bechstein equation with C not zero and a time step not zero to fulfill this condition. And then we can make the here. then concludes so that uh, the FTCS is consistent but not stable and then we can conclude from that there that the FTCS is not convergent. <coughs> That is a nice application of the lexical equivalence theorem. That we almost use always. Of course, that is, uh, that is essential whether the numerical solution approximates the exact one that we refine delta t and delta x or not. And here it doesn't. So then we have established answer to question B. Now let's see what is in question C. Assume that C greater zero is times three by forward time or upwind method, also known as explicit Euler in time and upwind method in space. What is the main advantage of this method over the FTCS scheme in solving the linear action equation? So first we have to write down then the forward time upwind method or the forward the I call that so the explicit upwind method. And uh, for C greater than zero. see here that is something that you should know. That is for C greater than zero. How does that work? Well we do the time discretization as before. 
the standard first order discretization by the explicit Euler method. And now we do the spatial discretization in a way where we take the difference in the direction from where the wind is blowing. C is positive, the wind is blowing from the left. So we take then the upwind direction then is to the left. So then we take the difference by taking ujn minus uj minus 1 divided by delta x. So that will be then the explicit upwind method. We had in the exercise the case when c was smaller than 0. Then if c is smaller than 0, wind is flowing from the right. Then we have to take the difference uj plus 1 minus uj. Okay, so then we have established that for, we just we can repeat it here to make sure that we know this is for positive advection velocity. Now the question is what is the main advantage of the, this method over the forward time centered space scheme? So what would you answer there? Is conversion. Yes, that is the point, exactly. Compared to the FTCS, so this scheme explicit upwind method is conversion. So we have a chance for that. But we have a condition. What is the condition? Do you remember that? We have a limitation here. We cannot do it for every uh, delta t. that I gave yesterday, if we have here the xj, the xj minus 1, here we have tn, tn plus 1, then we have to make sure that the characteristic coming from here with the slope, so where, where this is uh, c delta t, so this is the characteristic with the slope d x of t, dt is equal to the advection velocity c, we have to make sure that this point that we get here, that is xj minus c delta t, which is where the characteristic is coming from, that that is between the grid points xj minus 1 and xj. And that condition means that c divided by t c times delta t divided by delta x, which the delta x is this, it's a grid spacing, that has to be smaller or equal than 1. Then it will be somewhere here. So the condition is that uh, c delta t, that is the distance that our quantity u has traveled in the time delta t, divided by the time that the grid space is smaller. And we have for the whole discussion, we had assumed that c is positive. So that will be the condition. And this is the, the CFL condition. Which is then that the curve, this is the current number. So the current number has to be smaller or equal to 1. We have assumed already that C is positive and times that is of course positive, delta x positive, so that is clear from the beginning. But that is then the limitation. We cannot choose the time step larger that the distance traveled gets larger than the grid space because then we would get outside and then we would have to do an extrapolation and that is always really dangerous and here it is fatal uh, for in numerics and also here in CFD. Okay, so then we have uh, this is then the condition. 
So it is convergent for, you can add that for that condition where this where the C is the term. Because it is only uh, stable for this. Okay. Any questions so far? Then we look at the deep. What boundary do you need to specify a boundary condition for the interaction equation with C greater zero? When discretized with the forward time uplink method. Why do you not need to specify a boundary condition at the opposite? when you do CFD. What boundary conditions do you specify? How can we solve that? Well, we can look at the characteristics. We can look at our domain. We write here the time. Say this is the left boundary of the domain, this is the right boundary of the domain. And if we have C positive, we have already indicated here, then the characteristics will go from uh, lower left to upper right. So that means characteristics will have then this slope. So let's see, we'll have characteristics. This is the entering. So these are the characteristics D x of t dt equal to c. That's what they are. These lines are x equal to some x0 plus c times t. And this x0 that is different, and they are different of them, or a bunch of them. But the important thing is to see at the boundaries now. And the boundary, the left boundary, we see that the characteristics are entering. Here they start and they go to the right. So they, and they are transporting the information. The solution is constant on the characteristics. So that means we have to give boundary conditions of left boundary where the characteristics are entering. So boundary conditions That is for C positive. And you had in the exercise C negative, then it was just the, opposite, the other way around. Then the characteristics were going this way, and then the information was entering from the right, and then we had to give boundary condition at the right boundary. But here we have C positive, so this is where we have to give a boundary condition. So here we have to describe U of x a t, say as a function for the g of t. In varying time, that is no problem, but we have to give the condition there. What about the right boundary? Do we need boundary conditions there? No, Hainer says that, right. And the reason is, what is the reason? The house is in the domain, so just kind of extrapolate. Yeah, the information is coming from the domain, so we can take the information from there. Exactly. If we have an example, for example, look at this point here, then the information is in that case coming from the initial condition. We know that we have a solution. We know that it is constant around, so the solution here is then here. It is given in that case by the initial condition. If we would go a little higher up, and we would come back down here, then the condition would be given by the left boundary condition. So in either case, the solution is given. So then 
no boundary condition must be given at the right boundary because the, the characteristics are leaving the domain. They are carrying information from the domain which we know, either from initial or from boundary conditions. So that is essential for many CFD applications, just this. Okay. Regarding the FTCS, uh, sorry, not the FTCS, that is not, it's not, use, it's not uh, useful at all, but this explicit upward method. What would this give us at the boundary? Imagine that we are at the boundary, so then the J would be the index uh, corresponding to the right boundary, so it's called NJ. So then the value at the new time level minus the value at the old time level is equal to that is the value at the boundary, nj, and this is nj minus 1. So we can simply compute it. We can use the explicit upward method to compute the value at the boundary. So, and that is uh, as it should be. It is then really reflecting what we discussed with the characteristics. We can also imagine this picture here. If we go to the right boundary, this would be nj nj minus 1, and then we can simply compute it by knowing the value at the old time level, at the boundary, and its left name. So it's easy. So that is perfect. So, thereby, we have established the answer to problem 2. Do you have any question on this? This is really very relevant, not only for the exam, but also for general CFD applications. Not really time for break. Today, 10 minutes break, is that okay?